Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. I've made it my business to present good information about Norse language, historical linguistics, runes, and more related subjects on the internet in places where people are looking for them, supported by my generous patrons on Patreon and Ko-Fi. Today, what I want to talk about is a subject that often comes up among those who are interested in Norse language and linguistics, but which I see only the same old, often misinterpreted facts shared about online. And that is the uh, very divergent, in many respects, very archaic uh, Swedish dialect or independent language, depending on how you look at it, called in English usually Elf Dalian. Now, I resent that the name of this language, as usually presented in English, is Elfdalian, because people can't help but associate that with elves. And so they import uh, some romantic ideas about, I don't know, Rivendell or something, uh, or even, you know, some kind of J.R.R. Tolkien, like Sindarin or Quenya, elvish language, uh, to Elfdalian, and uh, I think a lot of those notions are misplaced. In general, I find that the romanticization of so-called, uh, you know, older forms of a language to be uh, misplaced and misguided because it's not right. There's no language that stays the same over a thousand years. Let's talk a little bit about this because it's important to establish why Elfdalian is interesting in a lot of ways and why people misunderstand that in, in, in many of those ways. Language evolution is actually pretty similar in a lot of respects to biological evolution. No generation is going to be identical to its parent generation. You don't talk exactly like your parents do, and you don't talk exactly like your grandparents do, and neither do your parents. By the difference between two generations, by the difference between you and your grandparents, you should be able to notice some differences. And if you don't notice what those differences are, uh, it doesn't mean those differences aren't there to a trained ear. Every generation acquires a language that it sort of remakes. Now, that may happen faster or slower, and it may often affect different features in different populations uh, who both speak a language descended from the same ancestral language. So an easy example of this with English uh, would be uh, some features of my own language. So uh, I grew up strongly sort of imprinted on my grandparents. So I acquired some older features of American English that people of my generation usually don't have. And the most prominent one, the one that I'm most often made fun of for, is that I distinguish W from WH, right? Uh, someone drinks wine, but someone whines about something. Now, that is an archaic feature that I picked up from them that people in my generation usually don't have. But they had an older feature that I didn't pick up. They distinguish between cot, C-O-T, sleep on a cot, and cot, caught a ball, C-A-U-G-H-T. I can barely hear the difference between those vowels. But even though uh, that vowel distinction is largely gone in, uh, well, largely gone in Canadian English and largely gone in my own region of Western U.S. English, it is still present in some other speakers' English. For example, in the Southern U.S., uh, you'll still often hear people who make that distinction. Uh, I've always noticed it in uh, the singing of Zach Bryan, for example. He distinguishes those vowels. So it's not unlikely that, say, Zach Bryan and my grandparents spoke very similar English. I inherited one archaic feature, the wa-hua distinction, and he inherited another 
feature that's becoming archaic, the cot-cot distinction. If one of our languages was the standard, you might get excited to find the other one speaking uh, the dialect that had the uh, distinction that the standard language lacked. But that doesn't mean that the standard from which your perspective originates doesn't also have archaic features that the deviating dialect doesn't have. And that's what's going on with Elf Dalian too. So it has some stunningly archaic features that it has maintained. Some features that aren't even there remarkably in the 1200s Old Icelandic that the sagas and the Eddas, right, our main sources of Norse myth, are written in. Uh, that's really something, right? It's amazing that a dialect could maintain features like that for so long. But it's also lost features that uh, other relatively archaic Scandinavian dialects have preserved. Um, relatively archaic Scandinavian dialects like Icelandic, and even on the continent, Standard Swedish is relatively archaic compared to Standard Norwegian or Danish. So let me give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grimfrost, uh, from a different part of Sweden, and uh, then let's take a look at some of these particular features of Elf Dalian. <laughs> You know what? I failed to mention earlier why this language is called Elfdalian at all in English. And it is because uh, that is an older English anglicization of the Swedish name for the area where it's spoken, which is the Alvdal. So that means river valley in Swedish, uh, not Elf Valley, which would be Alvdal. Uh, this, yeah, it's just an earlier English uh, interpretation of that. Uh, I would rather if we called it, I don't know, Alvdalian, just to, you know, back away from this elf association. Uh, but I can't help what people know it as in English. Um, in Swedish, you usually look it up and find Alvdalska. Um, that the equivalent of that in Alvdalian would be something like Uv, Uvdalska. Uh, but my impression is that speakers typically just call it Dalska. It is to say, Dalish, Valley-ish, language of the valley. Uh, there is an organization called Ulumdalska, which means let's talk in Dalish, uh, Elf Dalian, which works for the preservation of this language and, and presents some information about it online on their website and through some publications. Um, so they, they use that term for it most of the time, it seems like. Um, but right there, just in the contrast between what you would call this region in Sweden, in standard Swedish versus Elfdalian, you see a difference between these languages where actually Elfdalian is less conservative, where uh, L's have generally been lost between a vowel and another consonant in Elfdalian, but not in Swedish. So you have Elfdalian U versus Swedish L river, or Elfdalian Kol versus Swedish Kolv calf. So you know, if that was all we had to go on, people might not get so excited about the, uh, the, the so-called, you know, ancient structure of Elfdalian. Now, structurally, Elfdalian is fairly archaic, but there's a huge but here. What people are talking about is not Elfdalian as spoken by the couple thousand people who still speak it in that region. They're talking about how those people's great-grandparents spoke it. Because the people who speak it now have been in the Swedish school system and so were the parents, so were the grandparents, and I mean, so were the great grandparents. And over time, their language has approximated more and more standard Swedish. And so it's lost a lot of the structural characteristics that used to make Elfdalian more archaic. The most prominent example of this is the case system. So if you're in my Old Norse Zoom class, um, you have struggled through the way that Old Norse distinguishes between nominative, accusative, genitive, and dative nouns. That is to say that nouns have different forms, typically different endings, sometimes different vowels in their root, depending on what they're doing in the sentence. Parallel with the difference between, say, English, I, me, my, but all nouns and pronouns have that distinction and have an extra distinction between accusative direct objects and indirect objects which are dative. Now, uh, 
Elfdalian a hundred years ago preserved much of that, although I think kind of fascinatingly the case that it dropped is the case that Scandinavian languages typically keep and English and English keeps, which is the genitive, right? The uh, form where you add an S to make a word possessive, right? When we say like English, uh, you know, raven, ravens, paralleled by uh, Norwegian raven, ravens. Um, so Talian actually loses this, preserving it only as an S that can be optionally added to the dative to make a kind of quasi uh, genitive that's not actually descended from the Old Norse dative, uh, g Old Norse genitive. I find that kind of fascinating, right? Because it's like, well, we're, you're maintaining this case system and actually losing the one piece of it that uh, speakers of standard Swedish or English are familiar with and, and easily intuit. Uh, you know, that's a great example of how uh, languages descended from one common ancestor can maintain certain archaic features and lose others. I think probably the most fascinating example of how Elfdalian is particularly conservative, though, uh, is a little bit, some, some sort of subtle things going on with vowels. And the probably most remarked upon feature as far as vowels go is that Elfdalian preserves vowels that were nasalized in Viking Age Old Norse still as nasal vowels. So, this means that something that in uh, modern Icelandic is al, modern Swedish is po, uh, is in Elfdalian all with a nasalized vowel, which is exactly what we expect it would have been in the common ancestor of Norse of all the living Scandinavian languages. It still would have been nasalized in Icelandic in the 1100s, based on information that we get from the first grammatical treatise written in Iceland at that time. But this nasalization had disappeared already by the standard uh, classical Old Norse, which is the, the Old Icelandic of the 1200s that the sagas and Eddas are written in. So that's a remarkably, remarkably archaic feature that's still present. Intriguingly, that nasalization has actually spread to words that didn't originally have it. So Elfdalian maintains, here's another archaic feature, a distinction between dual and plural in the first person and second person. That is to say, there's a different word for we too, if I'm talking about, you know, a couple, or if I'm talking to just one person about me and that other person alone. That word is when. And the word for we, if we have multiple people, which is weir. Now you might notice is, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't speak a language that has nasalized vowels, right? So my nasalization might be a little weak, might not quite sound right. But there is a nasal vowel in that wind, which is not something that you would expect. So nasalization has actually crept into places where we wouldn't expect it, which is kind of interesting. Potentially what's going on there is that um, often in Old Norse writing, so here we're going mostly by Old Icelandic, but still, we see that that, um, that, that well, it's written as a V, and... Um, and Old Icelandic written as a W in Elfdalian, that first consonant, that word for we, we the we, uh, is lost if it's following the verb, which ends in an M. So maybe the verb ending M is nasalizing the vowel that's following it, and then that's just being carried over to when the pronoun is not following the verb ending. That seems like a possibility and kind of an intriguing situation. Uh, Notice here that Elfdalian is probably the most conservative of Scandinavian languages in this respect because other Scandinavian languages either generalize the plural, so it typically happens in East Norse, so like Swedish V, uh, vl, if you're that kind of Stockholm person, is from uh, Old East Norse, weir, uh, the plural, uh, different from ver, the Old West Norse plural, and um, in modern Icelandic vid, uh, modern Norwegian Nynorsk me, those are from the old dual. So that's, uh, uh, they, they've generalized either the plural or the dual. They haven't maintained the distinction between just we two and, and we many. Now I mentioned the verb ending there, and uh, that is another case where Elfdalian is pretty archaic because it preserves different verb endings. Now, it is less conservative than Icelandic in this respect. Icelandic 
uh, still reflects all of the category distinctions made by Old Norse. That is, there's three distinct plural endings, a we, a y'all, and a they, which Elfdalian has. And Icelandic also distinguishes between a first person I, a second person you, and a third person singular, he, she, it, does. Now, typically in the Scandinavian languages on the continent, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, you have just the old second or third person singular, the form that ends in an R in Old Norse, that's generalized to the entire paradigm. Right? So you have, um, for example, modern Norwegian, ja er, du er, han er. Uh, vi er, der er, di er, in contrast to Old Norse, ek em du ert, han er, ver erum, der eru, der eru, for the verb to be. So Elfdalian collapses all of the singular endings into one, into an ir, but it does preserve endings in the plural that are descended from those distinct plural endings in Old Norse. And notice that the second person plural ending in Elfdalian is descended from the ith, ending, which is West Norse. Intriguingly, in East Norse, that is to say, the uh, dialects that make up the ancestors of most of the Swedish dialects and Danish and some Eastern Norwegian dialects, well, not really in this particular feature but in Norway, but in Sweden and Denmark, um, that second person plural ends in an N, not in an ed. So this is a West Norse form that Elfdalian has, even though it's conventionally speaking kind of across the border between West and East and is in the East Norse group. Elfdalian shows a mix otherwise of some West Norse and East Norse features. Probably the most noticeable is the pronoun for I, like I am speaking, right? I mean, uh, which is I or E in Elfdalian. This descends from the quote unquote unbroken form in Old West Norse, the ek, not from the quote unquote broken form that you see in Old East Norse, yak, which is the ancestor of, for example, modern Swedish, ya, ja, modern Danish, yai. Uh, but otherwise, Helfdalian largely shows East Norse forms, uh, including in the fact that there is not I mutation in the present singular of strong verbs, which is a really big characteristic that frustrates learners about Old West Norse that's not present in Old East Norse. It's not surprising that a dialect on the edge, right, this bordering dialects to Helfdalian that are firmly West Norse, and these bordering dialects to Helfdalian that are firmly East Norse. Not at all surprising that an edge dialect would have a mix of Western and Eastern features, uh, but uh, but worth noting for sure. You also see people make a big deal out of some uh, phonological, uh, that is to say sound, archaisms, conservatism, conservative features in Elfdalian. For example, Elfdalian has preserved W as W. This is something that probably even classical Old Icelandic didn't do. Probably already become a uh, bilabial approximate. Uh, so, for example, here, this means that you can get words that seem strikingly like uh, their English cognates, like weather, Elfdalian weather, right? Preserving both that W and that ed, uh, right? I mean, Icelandic preserves the ed, weather, uh, but uh, otherwise on the continent you, you don't see either one, right? You see uh, modern Norwegian var. Uh, it also preserves, well, that ed, that is to say that voiced TH sound that's in a word like weather, um, but it does not preserve thorn, right? So uh, words that began with thorn now begin with T, or if they're low stress, potentially with a D or an ed in an Elfdalian context, which is probably what it was in an earlier form of Swedish, Norwegian, and Danish too. Uh, I forgot to mention that aside from maintaining Old Norse uh, nasality, Elfdalian preserves, and this is kind of subtle, a feature of Old Norse syllable structure that's otherwise lost in modern Scandinavian languages. So Old Norse has uh, light syllables, that is to say syllables where you can have a uh, short vowel followed by a short consonant, so net. It has heavy syllables, so that means that the syllable either has a long vowel or a diphthong, like say uh, and it's always, you know, I'm trying to come up with examples off the top of my head, but um, os, the accusative singular of pagan god, os, or um, or a uh, short vowel followed by two consonants. So, for example, in a syllable like fall, uh, fall, like take a fall, 
And then Old Norse has consonants that are overlong. They have a long vowel or a diphthong followed by a double consonant. So a good example of that would be uh, sickness. So t potentially already for us, but it's so t uh, sickness in Old Norse. Now on the consonant, uh, the standard Scandinavian languages, Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, generalize a sort of they, they re-lexicalize this, so they have what are called long and short vowels, but now they're not distinct by length, right? It's not that you actually have the same vowel, but it's longer or shorter, E versus E. What they generalize is an actually slightly different sound that's in short versus long syllables. Uh, so you have, for example, uh, an Old Norse word like skip, meaning ship. There you've got that short E sound. Now, in uh, standard Norwegian, that becomes sheep, where the vowel maintains its quote-unquote long sound. But in standard Swedish, that becomes hwep, hwep, where the vowel stays short but becomes something distinct from its old long vowel realization. And we express that it is a short vowel by writing the consonants double after it. So the the syllable structure is revised on the consonant to fit syllables in one of those two categories. Um, that revision of syllable structure hasn't happened in Elfdalian, so that you still have Old Norse short, long, and even overlong syllables. So for example, that example that I used earlier of an overlong syllable in Old Norse, like so um, sickness, in uh, modern Swedish, it's actually kind of an archaic word in Swedish, but the soup, where you have the long vowel realization of that, but you now write the T single to show that the vowel preceding it is long. There's no trace of the consonant after it being long too. Whereas in Elfdalian, suot, where both the, you have both the realization of the long vowel, which is uo in Elfdalian, and you have the consonant after it preserved as long. That is uh, unique among all the Scandinavian languages spoken today. Pretty, pretty fascinating archaic feature. Speaking of which, uh, though, I mentioned that that old O goes to uo, and this is a non-archaic feature of uh, Elfdalian, that old long vowels have largely diphthongized, sometimes in ways that are extremely familiar to English. So kind of mirroring the English great vowel shift, or in fact, the uh, vowel shift that happens in High German or Standard German. So that Old Norse is uh, is Elfdalian ice. Old, Old Norse moose is Elfdalian mouse, with both of those meaning what they mean in English, ice, mouse. So among those, I mean, I think this is something that's kind of underappreciated about Elfdalian. You kind of arbitrarily have these words, weather, <laughs> ice, mouse, that are perfectly intelligible from an English-speaking perspective. Now, does Elfdalian count as a dialect of Swedish or as a language? In a lot of ways, this can be kind of a political question, right? Someone who's trying to emphasize Swedish unity or the Swedish identity of the Dalarna region might prefer to present it as a Swedish dialect. Someone talking about the question of mutual intelligibility is probably going to talk about it as a different language uh, because you would not be able to get away with speaking Elfdalian in a cafe in Stockholm. Uh, you know, I'm sort of agnostic slash indifferent about this question. Uh, I would certainly talk about it as a, a distinct language if I'm, you know, writing up a grammar of Elfdalian or if I'm, say, translating something into Elfdalian. And there have been some efforts to, to translate uh, world literature into Elfdalian and even to write uh, original literature in Elfdalian, which have been kind of interesting in the last uh, decades. But for, you know, if someone calls it a Swedish dialect, I mean, that's not historically untrue. It emerges from the same dialects that also generate the standard language Swedish eventually, uh, of course, you know, fragmenting, branching off at different points along the way. Overall, I think this is part of a really fascinating story about the Scandinavian languages history where you have a group of related dialects which 
you know, we can call Icelandic fairies, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, uh, all together and all of their varieties together dialects uh, that for 2,000 years have remained pretty similar to each other, but also diverged in a lot of ways. Right? It's not often that you have languages that have started diverging as long ago as, say, West Norse and East Norse did that are still so recognizably close as, um, even though they're not mutually intelligible today, Icelandic and Swedish are. I think that we really distort that fascinating story by trying to say, you know, like, well, which language is, is you know, the Viking language spoken today? And there is no language today that's exactly like uh, language spoken by any Viking. Um, I would say that if I were uh, a Viking, if I grew up speaking, say, 900s Old Norse, uh, what language spoken today do I think I would have the easiest time learning? Icelandic, hands down. Uh, this, it's structurally still the most like Old Norse in maintaining the four cases. And although there have certainly been a lot of phonological changes, a lot of changes in idiom, some uh, reduction in uh, inflectional complexity, I think that an Old Norse speaker would learn Icelandic most quickly. But I think that a speaker of Old Swedish would adapt semi-quickly to understanding Elfdalian and maybe vice versa, although I think it would take a long adjustment period because a lot of change has actually happened between Old East Norse and Elfdalian. Though, as I mentioned, in many different ways than it has happened in the standard Swedish language. So, you know, you're never going to find this you know, it's so weird to me the way people talk about this, the the revered place where the language of, quote-unquote, you know, our ancestors is still spoken. That just doesn't exist. And if it did exist, uh, even if Elfdalian were kind of your picture of what that's like, you wouldn't have enjoyed life in a place like that for the last thousand years because it hasn't been about Viking raids. It's been about farming and uh, making a subsistence living and going to church. <laughs> so I think the same people who idolize these things uh, often don't consider uh, not just the linguistic realities, but the social realities of uh, languages that have uh, really interesting, conservative, archaic features that are uh, worth study, but that it kind of befuddles me how people idolize. Anyway, well, I hope that has been a somewhat interesting um, introduction to Elfdalian for those of you looking for more information than you can typically find online. Um, I'll share some links to resources here and there, and I probably have previously in this video in text. There's um, a dictionary, Swedish Elfdalian and Elfdalian to Swedish by Lars Stanslan. That's really good. Uh, and some other resources that I think are worth checking out, uh, especially if you speak Swedish. A fair amount of the material about Elfdalian, naturally enough, is uh, available only in Swedish right now. But uh, for the present, let me thank those who buy my books. Let me thank my Old Norse students on Zoom. Watch for announcements of the next semester of that class, probably coming up in May and June. And uh, thank you to my supporters on Patreon and Ko-Fi, who allow me to continue making my living from talking about stuff like this in the world's most beautiful places. So for now, beautiful Colorado, and we wish you all the best. <laughs>